in the Geeks Not Nerds the Podcast. I'm Captain Logan. And I am Vince! Today's idea comes from Vince. Uh, well, actually, we kind of talked yeah. about this together and came up with it. You had an idea, I had an idea about your idea, and then we developed an idea together. Yeah, what's really interesting about that is that it morphed into something vague and nonspecific. Which is what we... See, that's what I think papers are about. <laughs> you know, you come up with a general idea, and then you develop an I- an idea about that idea. Like this is my opinion, and this is what I'm going to prove. That's how you write a paper. Come up with something spe- not specific, and then make something specific about it. Well, that's uh, kind of what we're going to try to do right now in the next half hour events. Uh, we're going <laughs> to talk about um, what it takes to be talented. Yeah, in any field, really. So, in other words, what we're saying is you have to be talented, and that's it, and the discussion's over, right? Yes. (laughs) Yes. Um, So, all you people who aren't good at anything, um, sorry about that. (laughs) Your life is over. Please exit now. No. uh, What what we're uh, we're really talking about is, uh, you know, whether you want to be a writer or an artist or uh, or, or you want to be an actor or uh, whatever whatever it is that you you want to do, um, that you want to get good at, we're going to talk a little kind of... They kind of your classic nature versus nurture thing. Uh, what 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 does it take to get really good at something? Uh, mm-hmm. Is it can, can can you? The real question is, can you get really good at something just because you get up someday and you say, "I want to learn how to do that." Um, mm-hmm. Like no matter no matter who you are, what your um, what your you know aptitude is on, on on any particular thing, can you just get up someday and um, say I want to do this? And if you put enough work into it, can you get good at that? I think there is this uh, prevailing idea that uh, talent is just some inherent quality that you have, in talent in whatever particular field, and uh, and but but there's a term for that. It's natural talent. There there is I believe there is a learned talent. But uh, but do you believe in natural talent? I do believe that there is a, a, a bit of a natural talent, but I, I believe that there's a natural talent in a sense of uh, being exposed to that your entire life. So oh, okay, uh, yeah, well, because you have to hone it, right? Yeah, a person grows up being an actor or being or being or having like a natural talent for say acting or writing or whatever. Because uh, I mean, let's let's look at acting for example. A person grows up having a natural talent for acting because they were in an environment that fostered this ability for uh, for for mimicry or for uh, or for or for, for, for performance arts and uh, things of this kind. So, and when I say in an environment, I don't necessarily mean that this guy is the son of two parents who are actors. Who uh, and this guy because he was the son of actors is obviously a natural actor. Yeah, not necessarily. Yeah. And just because he was part of a theater community doesn't mean that that guy's a natural actor. I mean, he may have a flair for the performance arts, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he or she knows anything or is good at acting. I think you see this a lot with musicians uh, because I, I like you get like these like these brilliant uh, you know you know piano players or whatever or, or whatever it is they play or like uh, you know composers who have been composing since they were like three or four years old mm-hmm. and like they're 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 thought to be I mean my stepdad was like this and um you know you know you know they're th- they're thought to be geniuses and, and and probably are um but every case of this that I've ever that I've ever known um part of it uh, certainly had to do with um with their upbringing and their parenting. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's it's part part of it. I mean, the parents didn't even necessarily have to know how to do the stuff themselves, but they were brought up in an environment where they were able to that fostered this. You know, where, mm-hmm. where where they were able to develop it. Um, you know, it might just be enough that the parents uh, played a lot of music, um, a lot of a certain kind of music in the house, and so then um, the, the the kid uh, the kid thought about it, you know, a lot and was became very interested in it. There's a piano in the house. Uh, you know, the, the 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 kid has a piano teacher from an early age, uh, and that, that that sort of thing. And so I don't know. I, I think some of it is, is is probably natural, but you've got to have the environment to hone the skill. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that, uh, like, like for example, we're, let's stick with the music thing for a second. Okay. If you can sing, I do think that there is just a natural ability. Some people can and some people cannot sing. Some people just don't have the right voices for it. That's what I'm saying, is that you, you physically may not have the correct voice to be able to sing. Yeah, pe- people don't, and, and uh, you know, I, I sing a lot myself uh, in, in high school, way through college, and uh, you, not... You can't really do a lot to control your own vocal range. You can do some. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you, you know, you can you can certainly uh, get vocal 
lessons and uh, and, and and stretch your range out a little bit. But like people do are, are kind of stuck with the voice that they're that they're born with uh, mm-hmm. to to a certain degree. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's like playing basketball, right? You're either six foot nine or you're not. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. I mean, you, you know, you're you're gonna be uh, you're gonna be a tenor, a bass, somewhere in between. You may have a range that goes all the way through, but you're but generally speaking, and I mean, like I. I think I'm right about this. Generally speaking, I don't think you can you, you can you know just be like okay, I'm a tenor, but if I get really really good, I can make my range to where I'm a bass, like mm-hmm. you, know, you know you know you know to where I can sing like th- those really really low notes. I don't think it works that way. I think there are some people that can. Oh, there, there are. Yeah, but sure. yeah, that doesn't mean that it's part of human ability to be able to just suddenly do that. I mean, inherent human ability. Yeah, I I don't I don't think it is. I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert or anything. Yeah, we're we're speculating here. Yeah, but I met a guy at one point. Who, uh, but I think the point here is just that we are, to some degree, born with what we're born with. Yeah, it, but that's not to say that you can't learn things and become good at the things that you want to learn. Uh, yeah, right. I met a guy at one point who, uh, he could sing, I believe he could sing anyway, I don't know that I'd ever heard him sing, but uh, he had a ridiculously deep voice. Just, like, if there was a bass speaker, this guy was it, and uh, the thing he said to me was, it sucks, I can't whisper. <laughs> My voice is that deep that it carries that far, and I cannot whisper. That's interesting. And uh, so I think there are uh, physical limitations that people have naturally. And, uh, like, hmm. There was something I was watching. I forget what it was at this moment. But uh, they said that potentially every human carries about three mutations. It was Stan Lee's... Uh, Superhuman. Oh, that's a really interesting show, yeah. And uh, some, I didn't realize you never watched it. I've watched a few episodes, and some scientist on there said that uh, that every human carries about three... Well, the three mutations uh, that this person was saying is, is things like, uh, maybe you have blue eyes when there's no reason that you would have blue eyes. Oh, okay. Or, or maybe you have uh, you know red hair when there's no reason you should have red hair. It's not necessarily like you have a tail, or you have <laughs> the ability to... Uh, Fall flat in a in a small or shallow pool of water and not be hurt when average humans would. I have three mutations. I'm a vampire, a werewolf, and <laughs> and Kate Beckinsale. <laughs> <laughs> that's the scariest one. <laughs> but but yeah, you see, that's what I think a natural talent is. It's something that you have been in in a uh, an environment. That has fostered that ability, and you have a, a physical prowess that does not limit that ability. Yeah, and and you know certainly genetically, um, you, you know a lot of people will just you know have a a, a, pre- a predisposition to to you know that, that 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 helps them further a particular thing. But I mean, you know, if you don't um, if you don't hone a skill, you're not just going to naturally you're not just going to have it. You know what I mean? Or or even if I don't know, even if there is such a thing as natural raw talent. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't mean that you know the rules. <laughs> yeah. You see, that's the thing, is that uh, you've been in an environment, or, or you know, proverbially, figuratively, you, ha- the, the proverbially has been in an environment that has fostered the Vince ability. is now going to tell you about my environment. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, say you have been in a particular environment that has fostered the ability to act. So, uh, you get on stage, and uh, people can tell you you have something. Sure. Because yeah. I think that you can just recognize natural talent. I think it's something that's pretty easy. Like, this guy could do well if he knew what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. But there's still always stuff to learn. See, I have a friend who uh, who is ridiculously funny at times, but he can never repeat himself the way he did before. Oh. And uh, my friend Terrell. So, Cap here knows who he is. Yeah. But none of you guys do. <laughs> so why did I bring him up? Well, the point is, is that he and I have had several conversations where he'll say something to me, and I think these things would work great on stage as a stand-up act. But then he tries to repeat them back to me, and he can't figure out how he did it the first time. So it's not funny the second time. Yeah, it beca- it, it goes from being a, a joke to being cynical, and I think we need to figure out how to bridge the cap here, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you could do this. You could be a terrific stage presence. I do think that my friend has the ability to be a terrific stage presence. He just doesn't have the uh, the 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 uh, learning that would allow him to do it. Or experience. Or whatever. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, 
I, I always thought when I was uh, in okay when I was in junior high when I was in eighth grade I said I'm going to be a writer Vince that's what I did I said I'm going to be a writer you said Vince I'm going to be a writer I, I did yeah and um, this is other guy I knew <laughs> and and uh, I, I who I, also I, killed Superman so so I, so I, so I, I uh, started getting you know really into science fiction and I really wanted to, to write science fiction. And uh, I, I, I started coming up with this idea that I thought was great. And, of course, you know, I, I had that naive thing where I was like, this is brilliant. No one's ever come up with this before. You know, you know, look, look, you know look how amazing I am. I'm going to write a novel in a week and a half. And uh, so I started sitting down and I started writing this thing. And I thought it was great, you know, and I handed it to everybody I could hand it to. I was never shy about my stuff. I always wanted people to read it. Uh, you know, I, I gave it to my mom. I gave it to my grandma. Uh, I gave it to, you know, you know anybody who, wondered, who, who, who was wandering by who wanted to read something. You know, I'd, I'd, give, I'd give it to people. And, um... When you're in eighth grade, I learned something. Everyone's very polite to you about whatever your endeavors happen to be. Uh, they'll be like, you know, you know what, this is quite good. And when you're, I'm not saying that you shouldn't necessarily tell an eighth grader that his writing is really good because you know you don't want to, uh, uh, you know, you don't you don't want to you don't want to curb his enthusiasm. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but man. That wasn't good for me because necessarily because um, suddenly I thought I was brilliant. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, I started seeing myself as as um, you know I was like I, I'm you know you know Captain Logan is going to be the next Stephen King or something. You know like like <laughs> like I was had it in my head where. I always had these fantasies of, um, you know, being at, at book signings for hours and like, uh, you know, you know, uh, um, I always had this weird fantasy when I was in junior high that, that, that when I got, when I got really old and died, that like anything I ever wrote on a piece of paper was going to be worth millions of dollars. You know, you know, you know I kind of, I kind of had that. And, um, years later I look back on that stuff and of course it's terrible. You know, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you know, it's, 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 it's all, it's all awful. But, um, the one thing I will say, uh, is like, like the, uh, the one thing, the one thing I, I, I can't deny, and I, and I and I don't feel apologetic about saying this, is that I always had a good imagination. I, I always had that. Like there was always something raw. There was always something raw there. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where, where I, I had I had creativity. I had imagination. I just didn't know the rules. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the thing. Is they weren't necessarily good ideas, but I had them. <laughs> Imaginative and. Uh... And the ability to make good ideas, I suppose, are two different things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had a similar experience actually in in, in junior high. I uh, when I was in when I was in grade school, I wanted to be a writer, and then I wanted to be an artist, and then I wanted to be a, a god. <laughs> I'm kidding about that part. He wanted to be Thor. But uh, as I was a kid, I had this like this rolling. I want to be this when I grow up. And uh, when I got to junior high, I suddenly decided I want to be a writer again. And uh, I, I started writing down this, this horror novel that I had an idea for. And, of course, it was, it was awful. But uh, I remember everybody being ridiculously polite about it. They're like, no, it's a great idea. And I had this one teacher who told me, uh, it reminds me a lot of American Werewolf in London. You should, take, you should check that out, which, uh, in retrospect... A junior high teacher telling a junior <laughs> high student to watch that movie. I mean, you couldn't really point at a particular horror movie and say it's good for a, for a, for a young adolescent to go watch. Especially that one. Yeah, I mean, because there's, 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 there's quite a bit of uh, gore and nudity and things like that and jokes that you just wouldn't get as a kid. So, because uh, it is a very funny movie. See, that teacher uh, knew that they couldn't show you that in school, but there was nothing <laughs> stopping them from, <laughs> you know, from telling you to just go rent it. A recommend did not, does not necessarily mean that you can get your hands on what you're being recommended. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but uh, the thing that really stopped me from from going farther with that particular writing endeavor, which it sucked anyway, so. Who, uh, so it's okay. But uh, somebody said, you know, Vince, it seems like you just want to kill everybody that you know because <laughs> they <laughs> they started reading my book and I was like, oh crap! And I just stopped writing. I was like, okay, I guess I'm done for a while. Wow, you and I are so different because <laughs> because uh, the, the the thing that I've and and, and to this day uh, the thing I get criticized the most for is uh, not being adult enough. <laughs> In, in the things I write, uh, people can't take me seriously because I don't ever put anything adult in my stuff. You know, I could count on have... one hand the number of times anybody has mentioned, much less had sex in a short story I've written. You know, uh, Cap, I, what was it? When people tell you this, and this really bothers you, maybe I shouldn't even bring this up, 
But uh, the idea that somebody say you'd make a terrific children's book writer. Now, I think you would. I think you'd be good at it. That doesn't necessarily mean that'd be the only thing you'd be good at. Sure, yeah. So uh, a person may have a talent for one thing, but uh, just because you write... For example, ooh, here's a good idea. Bill Jemis, I think is... Or how do you say that guy's name? He used to be the president of Marvel. G-E-M-A-S. Whatever. Bill, that guy. He, uh, he, he was writing children's books, and then he was, he was writing for Marvel, and then he became president of Marvel, to my understanding. And uh, so you can do more than one thing. Yeah, And uh, this is where all the people who think that comic books are, are children's <laughs> literature come in and say, but he's doing the same thing. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, that just means they haven't picked up a comic book in the last 20 years. But look at Brad Meltzer. Or ever. I mean... Uh, <laughs> I mean, look at uh, I mean, look at Brad Meltzer. Look at uh, the guy that wrote the novelization of uh, No Man's Land. Greg Rucka. Yeah. I mean, we have people. Not to mention are... all of his other wonderful work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it that every time we bring up Greg Rucka, the only thing that we talk about is the novelization of No Man's Land, which is fantastic. But I mean, like, he's a good comic book writer too. Okay. I suppose we could talk about Whiteout. How's that? Sound? No, 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 no. He's he's written, he's written a lot of good superhero stuff. See, that's the thing is that we have these people who are, are multi talented. I talked to a uh, to a novelist at one point, and. Uh, Unless I'm getting my people confused here, I've forgotten the name, man's name, but he's written a bunch of uh, Indiana Jones novels, things like that. And he said, uh, really, you can only do one of two things. You know, you can get good at writing movies, or you can get good at writing novels, or you can get good at writing uh, plays, or, 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 or whatever. But uh, you pretty much have to choose your path. I don't entirely agree with that. I don't agree with that either. And uh, I think that having a focus is good. Yeah. I think that uh, really learning something and getting to the guts of something is good and wonderful and something that you should do. And uh, I do think it's even worthwhile if, if it's in your, uh, in your schedule to do it within your lifetime <laughs> to uh, become sort of an, uh, an expert, if, if not just a, a bit of a fish, an aficionado about something. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And, and, I, and I'd also say that, um, you know, for, for people who are, you know, just, just really competent um, at whatever they, they set out to do and um, are really prolific, that, you know, if you start early enough, or even if you don't necessarily, um, we always talk about how life is short. But yet, there's still enough time to learn how to do more than one thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, okay, for example, uh, it's interesting that uh, people have this idea that you can only really get good at one genre of writing when uh, to be a major, to, 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 to be an English major at the college we went to, at KU. Mm -hmm. uh, and, University um, of Kansas, for those of you in Kentucky University who are wondering. Of Kansas, Kansas into, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, but anyway, that's KU. And, and um to uh to to do that and see you made me lose my train of thought man <laughs> that was funny Go no, why you, no it wasn't funny at all but to do that you have to uh, take several genres you have to take you have to take several genres uh, if if you if you want to um have an emphasis in creative writing and uh so you have to do three or more genres mm -hmm. and um so it's interesting that people have this idea that you can only get good at one because they make you do more than one in school <laughs> i suddenly don't remember the genres i took I took, I took nearly everything. Uh, I think... I'm trying to think if there's anything I didn't do, uh, because because um, the, the, the genres were... Uh, f well, well, I didn't do any kind of uh, creative nonfiction. That was maybe the one thing I didn't do. Because uh, mm -hmm. there, there was a class in that, I think. But uh, there was, there was, there was uh, you know, there was obviously fiction writing and playwriting, um, screenwriting, and poetry. I took all four of those. See, that's the thing, is that I know, I, I know that I had to have taken three because that was a requirement. But you're not sure what they were. No, you did screenwriting, didn't you? Yeah, but I didn't do it with the English. You had to take the English screenwriting then how did you course. Man oh, maybe you only had to take two. I mean, I graduated. No, maybe, it was I, only, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it wasn't three. Maybe it was two. I have my college diploma right over there, and I always thought yeah. it was three. I didn't take... Well, anyway, it's not important. I don't know why we're talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the nature of talent is uh, I had to graduate <laughs> with three yeah, credits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, let's uh, let's kind of get to the bare bones of this, uh, shall we? Let, let's talk a little bit more abstractly, a little a little more uh, generalized, just just kind of across the board, so that we can kind of get to some kind of um, cohesive idea. Uh, something I'm always saying that I think is uh, fitting to, to to bring up once again here is that you you can certainly break rules, but only when you understand how the rules work. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that that's true in everything. I think that's true uh, for writing, but I think it's also true for acting. I think it's true for, well, there's tons of different kinds of acting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I think it's true for, for, for art. Um, it, um, it's even sometimes true for, for, uh, for music, depending on what you're talking about. And so, um, and, and so I think that uh, when, when we're talking about what the nature of talent is, um, you know, regardless of, like, how a person becomes really good at something, uh, that's always somewhat going to be in the eye of the, of the beholder, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like there's like there's always going to be some subjectivism in whether or not a person thinks you're good at something because they are basing that on a standard. And mm -hmm. so, if you're just like if you're talking about just raw talent, um, you know, people are still uh, sometimes going to cut to cut you down if you don't get good at it based on a set of rules. Yeah, I I do think there is a set of rules, and, and this coming from a couple guys who went to school for writing. There, there are a lot of rules. Yeah. I mean, and when we say rules, we're not talking about these are the things you're going to be graded on in your class. Well, you are if you're going to school for this. But yeah. uh, I think what it, it really We're talking about the, the fundamentals of, of, um, of, uh, of storytelling. Yeah, there are things that go into a story that make a story a story rather than just events on a screen. Yeah, that's right. We're and uh, Exactly. <laughs> I suppose... Uh, it shows you what we were kind of talking about at, <laughs> at school. We took a lot of film courses. Now, Cap took I, some film courses too. I was, I was like, I was like to kind of uh, preface that, but anyway, <laughs> I just for some reason I, I, I always I went to school with the idea that I was going to write screenplays, and uh, that that's not necessarily the way to go. And uh, if you were to look at the classes I took, you would think that's not exactly what I did. <laughs> no, that's not anything like what you did. You took three semesters of playwriting, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But. Uh, See, the bottom line is is that this this set of rules for whatever your trade is is what allows you to uh, to to branch off from this. And of course, everything is subjective in 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 the in the world of uh, what I'm going to call art right now. I mean, I suppose you could call it all art, but uh, whether it be acting or singing or whatever. Sure. But uh, how you vary from that shows whether or not you have a base in what you're talking about. I mean, if you were to just go out there and say, "I don't need rules." I have a natural talent for whatever I'm doing. I'm just going to go out there and do it. Well, that can very easily be seen as shooting yourself in the foot because you better have one stroke of luck. It's just naive. It, yeah. it really is just naive to think that way. And, and, and it's unfortunate because a lot of the reason that people do art is because it makes them feel a sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. And so to be told that you have this big set of rules you have to follow in order to do something artistic is really counterintuitive for a lot of people because they're like, well, what's the point of doing something that's supposed to be freeing if I'm forced to do it a certain way? Mm -hmm. And uh, that bothers a lot of people. Um, I've, I've, known, I've known a lot of people who, who, uh, who, who want to write and would like to write for a living, but refuse to uh, like re refuse to be told how to write they, they refuse to, 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 uh, to go to school or even read books on writing or anything like that because they have the way they want to do it and they think they can be successful at it and I, I mean I, once again not to curb anybody's creativity uh, the, 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 be the beauty of, uh, of, 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 of art is uh, that you really can do it any way you want to Mm -hmm. But if you actually want to be successful at it, that's a different story. So I mean, like you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not telling people uh, that that um that you know they they have to do things any particular way. Yeah, just because you didn't go to school for painting doesn't mean you can't paint something. That's that's right. Yeah, yeah. And just because I mean, like you know, we're certainly not trying to be elitist about this at all. Just because you didn't go to school for writing doesn't mean that you sh that, that that you shouldn't write by all means. Yeah, and there's such a thing as personal study. Yeah, absolutely. So you don't need a, a little piece of paper no, no, to no. tell you that you, don't you did need, something. You don't need a, a degree to be successful at writing. We have degrees, and we don't know. If will ever be successful <laughs> that's not that, that's that's not important but um i i went to school because i wanted to get good at it mm -hmm. um and uh and, and, and i mean that's 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 why i went there's plenty of people who got good at it in other ways that's just how i chose to do it See, um, I, I wanted mentors i i knew that i would never get good at this if i if i hadn't gone to school because i knew that school was an environment that would teach me to do what i wanted to know how to do mm -hmm. so uh, so i went to school but uh, I could easily see that uh, somebody who has a, a, a strong uh, history reading whatever they needed to read, you know, be it uh, modern or, or classic literature, and, uh, and had the, 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 the savviness, <laughs> if that's a word, to pick up on the elements of story that make a story worthwhile. So if, if they have the ability to do that, they don't necessarily need to have gone to school. It doesn't really 
look at my own background and I wonder how I got good at the things I got good at and why I suck at the things I suck at. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I always go back to uh, when I was a little kid in kindergarten, first grade, and uh, the thing I was saying I wanted to do back then was I wanted to be uh, an, an artist. I wanted to paint um, <laughs> or, or, or draw. And um, for years and years, and I've probably said this before on the podcast, for, for years and years, um, every so often I would sit down and get a, in a spurt where I would write, where I would draw a lot. And I was never any good at it. I could not get good at it. And um, I've always wondered why that is. I've always wondered if, if, I, if, if it's because I just, like, physically, naturally don't have the pension for it, or uh, if it's because I think that I... Um, like, like, uh, you know, gave it the concentration that 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 I should have, and you know, trying to learn the step by step processes, but just couldn't figure it out. Or if I really was just too lazy about it, like, like, like I, I always wonder. I don't know. You know what I mean? Hmm. And really, every couple of years, I sit back down and I and I get drawing books and I try to uh, do it the way it tells me to, and I can't figure it out. I just, I just, I just can't do. I can't get the the perspective down. I can't, I can't get proportions down. I can't figure out how to make, um, how to make um, you know, two arms look like they're proportionate with each other. I can't figure out perspective. You know. All, all, that, all that kind of stuff. I just can't do it, and you know, I wonder if it's. Artists, they can't do it either. And I wonder if, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, but I, just, I, I wonder if, um, if it's if if I just don't have the the ability, or 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 if um or if there actually is a method, if there's somebody who could teach me how to get how to get good at it. And I, I don't know. I just I find I find that extremely interesting. I once heard an artist say, you will make a million bad drawings before you make a good one. And see, I always say that about writing. I always tell people, you're going to write you're gonna write a lot of crap before you're going to write anything good. I say that all the time. Mm -hmm. And people hate it when I tell them that because they want the first thing they write to be awesome. Mm -hmm. Maybe I want the first thing I draw to be awesome. Maybe that's the problem. But here's, let me say this real fast. Here's what's really, what's really weird about it. I'm bad at math. Like, I've always been really bad at math. And I've always been really bad at anything where there's one right answer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm critical analysis guy. Uh, and anybody who knows me knows that. That's what that's what I'm good at. You, you you get something you get something abstract. You get it off the surface. You get you 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 look you look deeper. That's what I'm good at. You know what I mean? Is um is uh, I'm I'm good at I'm good at finding angles and things and um and uh, trying to trying to derive meaning from something. That's what I enjoy doing. But man, if there's one right answer, I'm not gonna find it. <laughs> I'm not gonna find it. And um I've always wondered if that's the reason I can't draw. You know. The, the thing about being an English major was uh, you would be successful if you could successfully argue your point. That's right. I mean, uh, you don't necessarily need to believe your point it's just to be able to successfully argue epitome it. epitome of BSing papers. So, I mean, so there's a lot of people that sit down and go, I don't know how to write. I'm like, yeah, you do. You just, uh, <laughs> you just don't realize you do. Because there is a skill that is called writing that you can learn to do. And, uh, that doesn't mean you'll, have, you'll ever have a good idea to save your life. Yeah, but you can, but 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 you can do the technical thing. You can learn to argue a point, and uh, and I could probably learn to do a math problem. But I don't know if I could learn to take that math and turn it into, <laughs> you, you, you know, you know what I mean? Because I mean, I, I'm just saying, not that drawing is all mathematics, but I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, you know, the thing about art for me was uh, I was good at like still lifes when I was in high school and in college. I could do still lifes. That's what's really interesting. I could kind of do that. Um, detail is the thing that I could do, and um, my, my wife makes fun of me because because uh, you know you know she can sit down and you, you say you know draw a pencil sharpener and she'll draw something that kind of sort of looks like a pencil sharpener you know what I mean like mm -hmm. you, you know she can sit down and just kind of give you the basic shape I can't do that I gotta draw everything I I, I, gotta, I gotta every nook and cranny I gotta I gotta do all of it it's not gonna look good but like I I, I have to put every little little piece in there I am apparently I am that detail oriented hmm. It's really strange. I have no idea. See, I always liked doing still lifes. I mean, uh, but uh, the one thing that I could never figure out was the human being. I could not draw a human body. Uh huh. Like, I could figure out what proportions that fruit needed to be to each other, but I had no idea where to put the arms in relation to the head. <laughs> yeah, I, much less put it in, 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 a, in a pose without looking at it in a pose. Yeah, like, the only thing I could do would be, like, to trace around the person. <laughs> Lay down this sheet of paper. I'm going to draw a life size, life size picture of you. And so this is this is where I'm getting at with this. This is what I wonder about. Um, I can say something like, "I'm terrible at math. I, I don't I, I don't have that kind of that kind of brain." Um, you know, you know, you know, math science. Um, the you know, you know, the like like basic, you know, 
book smart kind of stuff. What do you know about how the world? I'm terrible at geography. Like you, like you know, you just just like memorizing stuff and remembering it. I'm no, I'm no good at this stuff. Like I'm, I'm you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I have talked to people who are very good at that kind of thing who tell me the opposite thing. Who say I have no imagination. Yeah, I have no creativity. Um, I, 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 I've never had a creative, a creative thought in, 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 my, in my whole life. So, like, is that true? Or, or like, do, do these, do these people exist, or have they just not actually honed their creativity? I, you know, the thing about me is, I, I've always believed that everybody has the capacity for everything, essentially. And, uh, so you don't buy the right brain, left brain kind of stuff. See, that's the thing is, I'm not entirely certain. But I'm when, not either. That's that's where I'm getting at. See, when I when I look at people, I think, why can't you just figure this out? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, like, all right, I went to math class. It took me forever, but I figured it out. Like, why can't some people just figure something out? And uh, and I I feel like it's unfair for me to have that idea in my head. And uh, I know it sounds like I'm being a hor- horrible jerk to some extent, but uh, I, I keep thinking you can figure something out. You can create something that is uh, close to the desired result, even if you're not used to uh, used to having that big part of your life. I mean, I could sit down and if I really tried hard, create something that looked like a person that was not a stick figure. Yeah, maybe it's just a, a really complicated thing. Maybe it's like... Different. I, this is going to sound hokey and, and, and soapish, maybe, but but um, maybe it's like the clash of different kinds of desire. You know, like there's a part of your brain that that is stopping you from doing something because you 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 deep down really don't want to do it. Like it's not anything that you that, that you're it's not you're not comfortable with it. It's you've never seen it as in your capacity before, so you don't want to do it. But then there's another kind of desire that wants to want to do it mm. uh, in order to, um, you know, in, impress someone or be successful in a certain way or whatever reason it happens to be. So, like, there's this immediate, I want to be good at this for this reason in, in, in the, you know, in the here and now, but in the long term, I'm not comfortable with it. I have, I, I'm not, so it's like desires clashing. You know, I, to some extent, I think that... I don't know uh, if what I said made any sense at all. No, it makes sense. It's kind of uh, spawning this idea. To some extent, I think that people will grow up understanding the world in a certain way. So uh, that's a good point. Part of the reason I always I've, I've never been good at painting. In fact, the, the paintings I've done look a lot like paint by color crap fests, <laughs> and uh, or paint by number rather. Paint by color. That's a lot like a painting, Vince. Yes, it is. Paint, paint, paint by color, and this part is red. <laughs> but. Uh, you see, I always I understood pencil. I understood putting a pencil to the paper and uh, and sketching something because I could do that. I understood that. But when somebody handed me pastels or paints or charcoal and said, "Go at it," I would look at them and I and I try to figure out what was going through their head that made me made them think I could figure out how to do that. And uh, the the result was always bad. Or well. I've, I created a couple things, but obviously they were done by a high school student. See what I'm saying? So I think that some people will go through life thinking in a certain way, and everything that they look at will be filtered through this glass. So then when they're asked to, to uh, do something that's totally contrary to that thought process, it's just really difficult. Yeah. Okay, you are Mr. Uh, Mr. Analysis. Yeah. Now, we want you to do a math problem that, that makes you think in a particular way. You need to be able to calculate this. Mm-hmm. And you say, well, I don't calculate. I analyze. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's two, there are two different things. And uh, to, to that point, you know the one thing in math that I really liked doing that nobody else did? Proofs. I like that comic book, too. Proofs. You know why? <laughs> because it's because a proof would uh, be a series of um, things that would get you to a point and you had to figure out how you how, how it got there. And so I could do that. Um, and a, and a, lot, a lot of people really hated that. But the thing was, it was a process and you already knew what the answer was. You just had to figure out how you got there. I could do that. That makes sense to some extent. I mean, 
for the analysis guy, you, you look at this, this staggering group of themes and how do they all relate together mm-hmm. to come down to a, a singular... Like, for example, you go see a movie and you're going to critique this movie. And you see something on screen. Well, this is an event that happens. How does that relate to the rest of the movie? Right. So therefore, you're sort of reverse engineering the uh, logic of the filmmakers. So I think that's I think that's sort of the point of of what we're getting at. We're done. No, I'm <laughs> no, no. Actually, uh, we're we're uh, we're already out of time. So let's go ahead and just go to rant, shall we? All right. Uh, you know, any final thoughts on uh, on this first? Uh, no. I mean, it's I, again, it's a pretty broad topic. Yeah. You know, and um, we kind of uh, we kind of covered a lot of different sorts of ground. Yeah, I mean, really, I I think that the the big thing that I'd like to say about it is sure. that uh, is that uh, I think that do people do have a natural talent that is fostered through their their environment, but I think that uh, or maybe that sounds contrary. I don't know, but uh, I do think that there is a learned talent that can improve upon a natural talent or or create one where there was none before. So yeah. I just think that one takes more work without the other. I'd also like to think that uh, that the, the, the human brain is an amazing thing and that people, um, to some extent, always have the capacity to go against nature. Mm-hmm. I'd like to think that. I'd like to think that if I really put my mind to it, maybe it would take a lot longer than anyone else, but I'd like to think that if I really put my mind to it, I could become a really good artist. Even though it's completely contrary to, um, to to what I naturally seem to be good at, I'd love to think that if I really did the work, that 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 that, that, I, that I could that I could get there. Um, uh, you know, it just just like um, uh, just like Christopher Reeve believed that um, believed that he could walk again, and lo and behold, he he moved body parts that he should never have been able to move again. It was mind over matter. Um, I'd like to think that if that's possible. That a person who doesn't seem to have an aptitude for for, for something um, could get really good at it. It's just going to take a lot, you know, a long time. Yeah, Robert E. Howard, the guy that wrote Conan and Cole and and all these different uh, Solomon Kane, all that stuff. This guy, I read uh, in a in a Conan comic book, the Dark Horse stuff. They have these little adventures of Two Gun Bob. They're funny. I think they're worthwhile. But uh, what he said, or or uh, what what. Uh, Robert E. Howard said, was he's a writer by trade, but he always considered himself to be uh, a person who was more suited to be in a boxing ring. So I think it's interesting to know yourself. I think it's interesting to uh, know what you're good at and what, what you think you could be good at. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that was just something that was maybe poignant and maybe figuratively oh, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, go ahead and uh, give us your, your rant, Vince. So... I've been reading uh, some uh, some older comics recently, and by older I mean uh, around about the, the, the 80s all the way up to uh, like last year. Uh, way back in the 2000s. <laughs> and uh, some back issues, we'll call them. And the thing that bothers me... <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, that's what we'll call them. <laughs> the thing that bothers me about some of this stuff is that they will put these uh, descriptions of past issues and work them into the body of... Of the comic book that highly annoys me. I I am a fan of if I pick up issue six and uh, and there's a there's just a paragraph at the beginning on the first page that says this is what happened in issues one through five. I will say thank you. I don't need to read that since I've already read one through five. I do not need to read this. So I flip to the next page, but. Uh, I've been reading comic books lately that will try to work in the descriptions of the past issues into the issues themselves, so it leads to this horribly stilted dialogue, and it leads to this uh, ridiculous, just like, loads and loads of just text on a page that are in all these speech bubbles. Plus it wastes a lot of time, because 22 pages ain't that many pages, so you want, you know, enough story to be told. Yeah, you're, you're wasting story time. You are... Ah, oh, I suppose maybe it's just a way of milking money out of the audience. That can, that's part of it. I think some of it sometimes too. And this still happens to this day. I mean, you're talking about older comics, but we still get this. Um, I, I I think that sometimes it's uh, it's comic book writers banking on somebody is you, you know the old Stanley adage: every comic book is somebody's first comic book. So um, even even if it's in the middle of a series, we've got to make sure that somebody can pick it up and read it. 
And that's just not always the case. Uh, you're gonna really, um, you're, you're gonna really hamper the uh, the, the ability of the, of the people who are uh, who have read all of them to, to, to continue to enjoy the, the, the comic. And, and you know, on TV, we complain all the time about the uh, um, about clip shows. Like 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 whenever uh, whenever you have a show where uh, to save money and, and like TNG was infamous for, uh, for for this one episode they did in second season. There was a writer strike and they were out of money, so they did a clip show. And it was terrible, right. and, uh, and and so you know we always complain about that in, uh, in in TV where they'll just make an episode that's uh, pretty much just clips from previous episodes. But this happens in comic books all the time. Yeah, I read one of those recently. That's kind of what spawned this. It was entirely about well, this is what happened over the last three years that makes us lead up to this part in Deathlock's life. I'm like, I don't care. Tell me what's going on in Deathlock's life right now. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's my point. It drives me nuts. I don't see why they think... The the new reader will get into this and go, this is written boringly. Is this what a comic book is about? Is just endless uh, text bubbles? That's it? And uh, if you were to pick up just a comic book that had just a paragraph at the beginning, that's it. That's it. This is what happened in the past issue to get you caught up. Marvel does that a lot now. See, they do that with all the Ultimate issues. Not that Ultimate's good anymore, but yeah. still... Yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm done. I'm just gonna sit here and get angry if I keep talking about it. Uh, mine's gonna be short. Uh, Vince, I, I have one simple question for you. Um, I want to know why, when you go to the few arcades or arcade-like places that we have left, why there aren't pinball machines anymore. I go to these oh. things and I can't find pinball machines, and it bothers me. It's because all the collectors bought them up. No, it's not. It's not why. Because the thing is, um, they're still making pinball machines. And so I don't understand how the, uh, the, the, the couple companies that make pinball machines even make any money. Like, because they don't, they, I don't see them in places. Like, okay, my wife and I sometimes go to Dave and & Buster's, and they have mostly, uh, like, ticket-type machines. And I kind of get that, because that can be kind of fun, trying to get enough tickets to get a certain thing, you know, whatever. But, like, that's not all I want. Like, they have that... And they have shooters, and they have like uh, racing games, and then you know, you know, you know, a few other things. And that all makes sense. What you do is you make machines that afford you a reason to go out, as opposed to staying home and playing video games with a controller. Mm -hmm. So you want to make something that people can't do easily at home. But that's a pinball machine. <laughs> and most people don't have pinball machines in their houses. So why, why did that go away? I, I, I don't I don't understand that. Like, like I really don't understand. Like, like I don't think that pinball machines are outdated. I don't think you can get outdated with that. Well, maybe there's a certain amount of overstimulation by uh, all these other brightly colored games that uh, that that are video games, these shooters, these drivers, these things. So, or racing. <laughs> I suppose driver. It's like you're a chauffeur on your game. Part of it could well, be yes, uh, part of it could be cost too. I'm not sure um, how much more pinball machines cost than other things. Um, maybe maybe they cost more because there's a lot. And also maintenance could be part of it because uh, they have a lot of moving parts. You know, because it's not all um, uh, it's not all digital like like you know just regular video games. They've got all these individual you know parts. But um, but I don't know. I, I hate to think that like that like you know we grew up and kids now can't enjoy pinball machines. Like yeah, I I I don't, I don't I don't imagine that that's something that can that can ever be outdated. Yeah, I mean, I always like pinball machines. I mean, granted, I didn't grow up on them. I just grew up around them. I'm not saying it's my favorite thing in the world, but I just you know I go to an arcade. I like to see a pinball machine. I kind of miss the day of going to a gas station and seeing a pinball machine just yeah, sitting there. Me too. Well, anyway, uh, thanks a lot for listening to Geeks Not Nerds the podcast. Uh, sorry this went a little bit long, but we had I guess lots of stuff to say. And uh, we'll see you again next week. I'm Captain Logan, and I am Vince. Thanks again!